New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, wet side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello. story of Red Cloud, an American legend, and Lucky 666, the impossible mission that changed the war in the Pacific. You can visit our guest online at tomclavin.com. Alrighty, now that we've loaded up our six shooters, let's join Tom Clavin and meet the fastest gun in the West, Wild Bill. I'm joined on the line by Tom Clavin, author of Wild Bill, the true story of the American frontier's first gunfighter. Welcome back to the History Author Show, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Well, you keep serving up books like Valley Forge and Wild Bill here, and I'll keep having you back to have the oh, yeah. honor and the thrill, really, as someone who loves history. It's a deal. <laughs> These are stories where, once again, here in Wild Bill, as with Valley Forge, we all flip over those pages mentally and we say, I already knew that story. Mm -hmm. Then we read a book about it and we say, wow, the truth is even more fascinating than we thought it was with all the myths. We build up those myths and that's what we talk about. We find out that they're just not true. There's no truth to them. Whereas with these, many times there is a basis of truth and the real stories that we get here in Wild Bill about this man are even more fascinating. He was really some guy, a man that 
I was glad I got to spend however many pages it is here getting to know. When you have a story, a figure who has had so many myths told about him, there are so many news stories that you would think as a historian you could go to and get that first draft of history. Those are wrong about him. Like Mark Twain, his death is reported, and that's wrong. Even James Butler Hickok himself, Wild Bill, he would embrace certain aspects of that legend. And when I read that, I could almost picture you throwing up your hands. So how do you go about sifting through all of those unreliable narrators to offer us this full, accurate picture? Well, one thing that helps is to go back to, you know, what they call contemporaneous sources. What was being reported at the time? And with my previous book dealing with the American frontier, Dodge City, that was actually a little bit easier because Dodge City pretty much covers the period from 1875 to 1879. And even on the far reaches of the frontier, there were quite a few newspapers being published. And sometimes you had these towns that had two or three newspapers. And so you could go back to these records. You know, when I was doing Dodge City, the Dodge City Times and the Ford County Globe had mostly been digitized by then. Sitting at my office computer, I could read about what was being reported about an event that involved, let's say, Wyatt Earp or Bad Masterson in 1878. And it was a little more difficult with Wild Bill because Wild Bill, for the most part, the action, even even though the book begins, you know, he, he was born in 1837, so you do have his upbringing during the pre-Civil War. You have his exploits during the Civil War. But for the rest of his life, you're talking about from the post-Civil War, from let's say 1865 until his death in 1876. And and especially in those, those five or six years after the Civil War, you don't have as many newspapers as you had, you know, in the 10 years after. So there were newspapers to go to. There were, you know, newspapers in Kansas City and in Denver and some of the other Kansas cities and towns and in Nebraska that were reporting on Wild Bill Hickok especially once he had become something of a celebrity on the frontier. So you can read some of the accounts that are a little more official in the sense that they were reporting on what was happening at that time. And then from there, you can read, as the decades went on, other materials that were written about Wild Bill Hickok. And it's a little bit easier to start separating the facts from the fiction. You know, Hickok did become a celebrity. He was like our first post-Civil War frontier rock star. And people were making up stories about him. They would take maybe something that did happen and immediately turn into a half fabrication or a half exaggeration. And then the next source would turn into a complete exaggeration. And then you'd have the dime store novelists who were writing mostly for an Eastern audience that would come up with absolutely fantastic tales. You know, I even have, as part of my research, I obtained copies of Wild Bill Hickok comic books. You know, they were writing comics about him. And in a sense, he, you know, he was like, Nowadays, you read Marvel comics and you go see Marvel movies with Thor and Spider-Man and Fantastic Four and superheroes like that. Well, Wild Bill was probably our first Civil War, post-Civil War superhero. Now, we didn't have the comic books then like we have now. We didn't have the movies that we have now. But you had these dime store novels, these pulp fiction novels, and you had the magazines like Harper's New Monthly Magazine. And they would embellish stories about these frontier figures because they knew they had this hungry audience on the East Coast who wanted to get all this, these stories about these legendary characters that were you know, walking across the frontier and, and, and trying to tame the Wild West. It was a lot of fun for those people. And, of course, you had these publications that were really to cater to them. That brings me to something that I didn't write a question about. I usually do, but I'm glad I won't forget it. And that's when people show the Old West and his period – What are the things that they get wrong producing those films for the same reason those pulp novels did, because it makes a better story? Well, one thing they get wrong is that Wild Bill has usually been portrayed by actors who are significantly older than Wild Bill really was. You know, Wild Bill was killed, and he was still in his 30s. The subtitle could be the true stories of the American frontier's first gunfighter, because he packed so much living into 30-something years you know, he was he was a sheriff, he was a farmer, he was a, a Civil War spy, he was a, a gunfighter, he was an actor, he was all these other things. But when he died, he was still in his 30s. And so when we see, even going back to Gary Cooper in the movie The Plainsman, Cooper was, was in his 40s when he played that part. When you have Keith Carradine playing Wild Bill Hickok in the series Deadwood, Keith Carradine was in his 60s when he was playing Wild Bill. They had Charles Bronson playing Wild Bill in a movie (laughs) when Bronson was in his 50s. You see these older actors, which means that the movie and television audience
audiences have not gotten to really appreciate what a young, dynamic, handsome man he was. I mean, he cut quite a swath across the frontier with his long hair and his outfits that he wore and his buckskin and his yellow moccasins and his sombreros. And he was a really charismatic character. And we don't, that does not really come across in, in any of the movies or television shows on which he's been portrayed. So that's, that's one thing I, do, I don't understand. And I think the other thing is that they've pretty much shown a one dimensional wild Bill Hickok, mostly show him as a gunfighter, which he was. But like I say, he played these other roles. He was an actor who performed on the, on the New York stage. He was sheriff and marshal and federal marshal. He was an army scout. He was all, all these other things. He's a gambler. He's a big-time gambler. Went from town to town, the gaming tables. So what I'm hoping in my book is that there is a really full three-dimensional portrait of Wild Bill, which we haven't had the, the luck to have on the screen. And he was tall. You picture these guys as squat, and I haven't seen a ton of the movies. I didn't want to pollute my mind, but just <laughs> the things you absorb from the ether, right? Seeing these old movies, and you picture them always dirty, filthy guys, usually, right? They just came yeah. out of the trail, and it was a, a dirty time. And you mentioned a few times in the book that he always took a bath. He always looked good. He bathed he every a, day. He, he, yeah. wanted, he wanted to present himself well. He bathed every day, which was pretty astonishing, he would have been the subject of ridicule if anybody had the courage, you know, to make fun of Wild <laughs> yeah, Bill, so which true. nobody did yeah. because they were afraid of him. Yeah. But he bathed every day. He would, when he was on the job, so to speak, as a scout or or a plainsman or a hunter or anything like that, he would wear the buckskin and the moccasins and everything like that. But when he was in town, when he was in Kansas City, when he was in Springfield, Missouri, and some of these other places where his primary occupation was gambler and man about town. He would wear these Prince Albert coats, and he would wear these vests, and he would have his long hair, you know, washed and flowing down to his shoulders and past his shoulders. And he cared about how he looked and how he presented himself. That became part of the, not only part of the Wild Bill legend and the myth, but it was part of the Wild Bill reality. You know, he really was not a dandy. I don't think that would be too strong a word, but he was he was a handsome man. He knew he was a handsome man, and he wanted to present himself well. And that's not just because you're afraid of him rising from the grave and yeah. <laughs> yeah. coming after you, right? That's right. <laughs> I think it's another thing where you picture these gunfighters as, hey, that's a slight. I don't like the look of you, boy, and just mm -hmm. popping a couple of bullets in you. For instance, with Theodore Roosevelt, when he's up in the Dakotas, he is in a bar and they start making fun of him because he wears glasses, which – similar to the idea of bathing every day where they'd make fun of you. Mm -hmm. They felt if you needed glasses that you had some kind of moral defect, as strange as yeah. that sounds to say today. Yeah. And the guy starts threatening him with his gun, and TR ends up taking him out with a punch. Thank you, Harvard boxing days, for him. Mm -hmm. But this isn't who Wild Bill was, which is a, something that comes across here in the book Wild Bill. It does say the true story. You give him many instances of him acting justly. He's someone who hates bullies. He doesn't want to see kids pushed around. He's a nice fellow. I mean, you wouldn't be terrified to be in his presence. In awe, maybe, but I don't feel like I would be afraid. Gosh, if I say I'm rooting for a different team in the Super Bowl, he, he might pop a slug in me. He wasn't looking just to wipe people out. No, no, he and he didn't have a chip on his shoulder. His code of honor, or part of his code of honor was, listen, I'll treat you the same way you treat me you have no problem with me. I certainly not going to have any problem with you. And he wasn't one that would that provoke a fight. In fact, he would sometimes break up fights or uh, defend the underdog. There's one, you know, there's one story in the book where he's walking through a town and he there's a commotion going on inside this bar and people standing outside looking inside. He asks what's going on. It's at the beginning of the Civil War. It turns out that the bartender there was voicing support for the Southern cause. And some of the other men who were in the bar were pro-Union, and they were starting, they were ganging up on him and beating him up. Now, while Bill Hickok was anti-slavery, and he ended up enlisting in the Union Army, he was not a sympathizer with the Southern cause. But he saw one guy who was in an unfair fight being beaten up by a bunch of other guys who were just ganging up on him. And he went in there, and he joined the fight on the side of the beleaguered bartender and beat the other guys up and threw them out, out of the saloon. He did have that sense of fairness of right and wrong. He did like children. He never, unfortunately, had any of his own, but he did like children a lot. And he did have a sense of justice, too, that justice should be done. He was not one that thought violence was the answer to a problem. He only resorted to it himself when he felt like he had no choice. An expression he used, I would never get, let somebody get the drop on me. If he felt threatened, okay, he would go for his guns. But he had to, if he didn't feel threatened, there was always another way to work something out. 
And if people are shaking their heads in disbelief about this, pick up Wild Bill, the true story <laughs> of the American Frontier's first gunfighter, and you'll have a ton of those stories that you'll enjoy in there, where he does try to diffuse situations mm-hmm. with humor, with saying, hey, you know, let's pop some champagne. Let's, let's just hang out here. He's not immediately going for the gun. And that's another Theodore Roosevelt thing where he said his father taught him and then TR taught his own kids. He never hit at all if you can honorably avoid mm-hmm. it but mm-hmm. if you have to hit put the man to sleep you know right. put him down right you know right. and hit him as hard as you can the worst sin is hitting soft that's who we meet here and i think that that's a nuanced view to use a popular word at the moment because here we're describing a man his personal arsenal is formidable he's shooting with both hands for one thing so he's he's twice as armed as, right. as a, a regular person would be he's carrying colt 44s uh, 36 navy colts 41 caliber derringers and if people don't know guns go look up what a 41 caliber bullet the size mm-hmm. of it what it'll do to you mm-hmm. then he has a bowie knife farmer style there shoved into his belt right even more impressive, he can accurately shoot with both hands. He's not firing willy-nilly. If he has six guys, he'll, chances are, put six bullets in them. So if he were alive today, needless to say, he's not getting on any airlines to go fly. He's, right. he's not getting <laughs> right. past TSA. Right. Today, we probably recoil with the notion of the gunfight. If people walking around armed makes most people uncomfortable. Even when we walk through, say, Pennsylvania Station in New York City or the Port Authority bus terminal or any airport and we see armed guards that are there to protect us, we're a little bit taken aback. It's a gun. That guy could take us out if he wanted. Mm -hmm. So what do you hope readers who do recoil at the notion of guns to one degree or another will take away from this very different era of history? Well, in those days, you had most people, I should say most people, because women certainly didn't carry guns, or very, very, very few. And there were a lot of business people who did not necessarily on a regular basis carry guns. But but anybody that had to deal with law enforcement, of course, who were cowboys, who were scouts, who were out in the country, so to speak, on the frontier because they might encounter hostiles, as they called them, some of the Indians, they were afraid of them. So there were a lot of people carrying guns. So the image or the, the reality of somebody carrying a gun by itself did not cause much fear among you know normal, regular people in, the, in, any, in any towns. But, you know, there, there were people who were not, you know, their personalities were not very stable. So they, you know, you, you, you would have people that would, that would have guns that would might think of a gun as their first resort if there was a dispute. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of accounts of the American frontier of people shooting each other in gambling halls because there'd be a dispute over cards. Somebody was cheating, somebody said something the wrong way, somebody looked at somebody the wrong way, somebody got too drunk and belligerent. And so Wild Bill carrying guns, but he did, as you say, he was, uh, when he was especially a lawman like an Abilene, yeah, he was walking down the street with his two guns, his Bowie knife, his Derringer, a shotgun, because at any moment, you know, something could happen and he was going to be prepared for it. He wasn't going to be fumbling around for something to shoot with. He was always ready and always ready to jump in. And I read one thing in Wild Bill where that's how he meets the boy who grows up to be Buffalo Bill Cody. Yeah. He's a young boy and he saves him. He jumps in to do that. He doesn't have to. And people just stay out of the way, right? He was the he was the very first. If you see something, say something. Never mind. He was going to do something. Yeah, that's a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up because it was, you know, Wild Bill did not like bullies. He thought they were really low forms of life and you pick on somebody who's smaller than you, who's weaker than you, that was totally against his code of honor. And that is what happened when his friendship with Buffalo Bill Cody began. He was only 11 years old. He was Billy Cody at the time. He was a, you know, he's working on this wagon train. His father just died. He, he was taking any job he could to help support his mother and two sisters. And one day they're camping, and this bully, who was another one of the teamsters that worked on the wagon train, said something, you know, insulting to Billy Cody, and Billy Cody, being kind of a smart-mouthed kid, said something back, and the and the, the bully goes to give him a good thrashing, and Cody throws a cup of hot coffee in his face, and now the guy's going to just tear him apart. <laughs> a grown, big, strong adult is going to do that. And all of a sudden, this voice calls out, it's Wild Bill Hickok, who was also a teamster. As, uh, you know, it was another thing. He was a wagon master and teamster in the frontier. And he said to the guy, you know, if you touch a hair on that boy's head, you're not going to be able to get up and walk for a month of Sundays. Wild Bill could put his punches behind his words if he had to. He was a really good physical, strong physically, and he was a good fighter. But 
he also had these very steely blue eyes, and people could look into those eyes and say, this guy means it. This is a guy not to mess with. And another thing about Wild Bill that I think is related to this is you know, everybody at one time or another has a fear of something or is afraid, usually appropriately in certain situations. Wild Bill was really a tough guy as far as giving into fear. He was a confident guy in his abilities, and he was not one that was going to get frightened easily. Certainly no, no man was going to make him feel fearful about anything. And he had this philosophy or this belief that the bullet hadn't been made that could kill him. He really, that, he really had this philosophy. <laughs> so when, he, when there would be a gunfight, when there would be gunplay, he had this confidence in, in the middle of this chaotic situation that he was going to prevail because none of those other guys had the bullet that was going to kill him. There's another one of these colorful characters in Wild Bill, and that's Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. Mm -hmm. He's another guy really would like to brush his hair, right? Yes. Picture him with those flowing locks and the mustache. And he was a guy who would like to read his own press clippings and, mm -hmm. and was going to build a name for himself and hoping that he might someday occupy the White House. All of this in his life is something that he works towards. He wants to have a legend. And he doesn't want anyone taking the pages away from him, taking the attention away from him. Right. So it's somebody you think he might clash with Wild Bill, who's getting all this attention. And yet Custer calls him a plainsman unlike any other of his class. How is it that he earned his respect? Yeah, that's interesting because, yes, you can compare Custer to Hickok. Hickok was only a couple of years older. Custer gained fame during the Civil War and as the boy general, and then his fame sort of waned like that of many officers in the aftermath of the Civil War, but he got a second chance to be famous again during the Indian Wars in the Great Plains, and he, he had the flowing hair, and I mean, the Indians referred to him as yellow hair or long hair, and he was also a, a handsome, dashing young man and, and enjoyed adventure on the, on the frontier. So there were a lot of similarities between him and Hickok. I think if Hickok had been a military officer, Custer might have felt rivalry, but Hickok was a civilian, so there wasn't that kind of two men in uniform who were both going for the same promotion or both trying to curry favor with the same commanding officer. I think that made a difference with Custer not feeling jealous of Hickok. And he also respected Hickok because Custer knew the value of good scouting. It sort of failed him at that little bighorn, but, yeah, good point. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but until then... You know, he knew if you had good scouts, you had a better chance of your mission being successful, and Wild Bill was a very, very good scout. And it's also interesting, too, because it's kind of clear from what Libby Custer, George's young wife, writes about Wild Bill that she was totally infatuated with him. There's a fairly lengthy passage that I quote in the book from Libby Custer's memoirs in which she is just gushing. You can see she's gasping on the page <laughs> as she's writing these words, when talking about when she first encountered Wild Bill at Fort Harker, I think it was in 1866. So she just fell head over heels, and Custer seemed to be okay with that. You know, a good scout's more valuable than a wife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Wives are not going to help you in a fight with the Indians, but a good scout's going to help you out big, right. a lot. Yeah, yeah, where was she at Little Bighorn, yeah, right? You could have used Wild Bill. Yeah, but... I know. You have so many of those moments in Wild Bill, your book, where you go through and yeah. if this was a novel, you would say, wow, this guy's packing a few too many yeah. cameos yeah. in here. He couldn't have met everyone. He's almost the Zelig of the Wild West where huh. everybody pops up, you know, and he's doing all these things that you wouldn't believe either. He doesn't play ping pong like Farts Gump does, but he does have a stint working for the Kansas City Antelopes on baseball. So this he's a baseball umpire. Crazy. He's a baseball umpire, too. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's pretty amazing because, you know, the frontier was a big land out there, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of square miles. And it's, it's interesting how often some of these famous figures cross paths with each other. I mean, Hickok and Buffalo Bill Cody, would, who became very close friends, would keep crossing paths with each other. And Hickok would uh, encounter twice Jesse and Frank James. We never got to meet the, some one of the accounts you talk about, the legends and the fabrications would have him encountering Wyatt Earp and Bat Masters, and that never happened. But it's amazing how many times you read a book and that's, that's in there. You know, even Richard O'Connor, who wrote what was for many years the definitive biography of Bat Masterson, has Masterson and Hickok in a shooting contest in Kansas City in like 1870 or something like that. Masterson was only 16 years old and hadn't even left <laughs> his parents' farm by then. But you have these characters that keep intersecting, and some of them are good guys, some of them are bad guys. And thankfully, Wild Bill, because he got around so much, there's stories you could tell and verify 
that he would encounter some of these people. I can say Frank and Jesse James at two different instances. They encountered each other were in the same place at the same time. So that's kind of fun. It, it means you, I can legitimately put in there, not fabricate, but legitimately put some of these names that have gone down in our our history of the American West is somewhat somewhat well known. And, and Wild Bill and and they respected Wild Bill. He was a, an iconic figure, you know, at, at a fairly young age, and and he became that prototype lawman that people years later, like Wyatt Earp, like Matt Masterson, like some others, tried to emulate. It's great that the book Wild Bill isn't just one guy getting the drop after another, him shooting people. I think that would that would get tiresome. It is easy to dismiss all those men who wound up on the wrong end of Hickok's gun, with apologies to the Allman brothers, as just generic henchmen in a film, right? When we watch a Western, often those guys aren't even aren't even named in the credits, the poor guys, right? Right. They don't get a backstory. They get nothing. Yeah. It's sort of like on the old Star Trek show. Yeah. You, you know, you knew the guy that was going to get killed when they beamed down to a planet. You didn't even give him a name. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they said Ensign. Yep. You know? <laughs> Ensign. And the guy get, might get one line. Next thing you know, he's being phasered yeah so that's true but in, in the book wild bill everybody has a name i mean there there are people that challenge wild bill there are people that fired at wild bill and he killed them it did happen not dozens and dozens of instances that, that were attributed to him but it did happen and i want to give you a little background who these people are you know these lives were being taken maybe you could say they deserved it in the sense that they were trying to kill wild bill and he had to defend himself but but who are these people what was their motivation where they come from. So we want to know who these people are, not just indiscriminately knock them off like Wild Bill was some kind of psychopathic killer. He was not. He did not want to shoot to kill, but there were a few times which are depicted in the book he was forced into it. You'd get a chance. Andrew Jackson, when he was a judge, guy came before him and he went out and got him. He had done some horrible thing. I believe he may have mutilated his wife, cut her ear off or some terrible thing. And he was just a, a madman. And Jackson's a judge. And he's saying, where is this fellow? Why, why isn't he here? And I said, well, nobody, everyone's afraid to bring him in. So he leaves the bench, goes out and grabs the guy. And they say, well, what the heck? You know, the whole police department, nobody else could get you to come to court. And he said, you know, I looked in that man's eyes, you talked about Wild Bill's eyes, important part of the book here as it goes on, Wild Bill. And he says, I said to myself, Hoss, you better just walk small. Yeah. And he gave him that chance. The same thing. And Jackson was also, I mean, he wasn't uh, as restrained yeah. as Wild Bill. But these are guys where that was a code of honor. Look, if you're going to say, okay, we're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. It was more civilized than today in a yeah. lot of ways, I would say, where people are look to take offense. And you hear there's been a shooting. The weapons are different, too, and people aren't trained to use them. But that's one of the things where they gave you a chance. Wild Bill certainly gave you a chance. And if this was a novel and not a true story, as it says right there in the subhead, the true story, you would say, I have sympathy for this character. OK, he's not shooting just willy nilly because he doesn't like the cut of someone's jib or their color or their creed. He always has a reason to do it. So that's a great thing. He doesn't disappoint you. You know, there's nothing worse than a historic figure that you want to read about. And then you say, ah, I didn't really like that guy by the end. You like Wild Bill. You root for him. Well, I think that's true, and I think in this case, as was the case with the book Dodge City, for example, is that some people might think, oh, this is the true story, so they're not going to do the legends, they're not going to do the myths, this is going to be the true story, oh, it's going to be boring, it can't be as interesting as, as some of the stuff, the, the crazy stuff that's been passed down from the generation to generation. But that's what the fun is, when you find out the true story includes events and characters that are more interesting, that are, that are more intriguing, that are more dramatic and things we never heard of, that Wild Bill was a New York stage actor. Yeah. He appeared in plays. <laughs> and you would have audiences flock into these New York theaters because they were saying, oh, my God, that's the legendary Wild Bill himself right there on stage. Now he's basically playing Wild Bill. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like he was, he was playing Othello, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, he, but, he, but he was still there, you know, reciting these lines. He wasn't that fond of it. He didn't enjoy acting, but he, he did it for quite a while because he was, cause he was in the, a production with Buffalo Bill, and they were making tons of money, more money than they ever made before. He finally couldn't stand it anymore, went back to the Plains and resumed his life back out there. But to find out aspects of Wild Bill's life, the whole myth about Calamity Jane, you know, he couldn't stand Calamity. Calamity Jane was part of his life. Uh, they are buried side by side. Yeah, not his choice. You know, in South Dakota, but not his choice. They <laughs> couldn't stand her. Yeah. But there was a woman he was very much in love with that, that he eventually married late in his life. And who knew that? And, who, you know, I think I think that's going to be another other revelation. You know, there might be 
we'll see if there's an audience among among women readers for this book. But one of the things I think that they may find interesting is that the woman he fell in love, the love of Wild Bill's life, was this very strong, independent, talented, and accomplished businesswoman who was the circus impresario, who ran her own circus that toured the country in an industry that was completely dominated by males. I mean, she was the only woman to own a circus in this country. And she had mouths to feed. She had a business to run. She was all over the country in all kinds of weather with her circus and her performers. And it was that very strong woman who was the one that Wild Bill fell in love with. He is a loving guy. And you start to, as the book goes on, really feel for him. You know, you start to like him and root for him. And then you say, oh, gosh, I saw those movies where (laughs) Calamity Jane is his love interest. And now I'm reading the true story. And there's another thing I asked you about movies and what movies get wrong. There's one right there. And that's chapter 18 of Wild Bill, Mm -hmm. A Woman Called Calamity. Then you deal with his wife and what kind of marriage he had. And I think that surprises people, too, that he was somebody who, when he got married, it was it was for love. And mm-hmm. he was attached and he was devoted. And he wouldn't be running around with Calamity right. Jane or anyone else because he took his vows seriously. Mm-hmm. There's another thing you don't get from those yeah. Westerns. You, you don't get that image of fidelity. Mm-hmm. And I think, too, one of the things I'm hoping with this book is that there has been a, an effort – over the years, to take some of our, let's say, characters from American history, let's be more specific, characters from the from our Wild West, the American West, and tear them down a bit. They sort of get built up with a lot of fictions and embellishments and exaggerations, and then the circle comes around and you tear them down. And uh, that happened to Wyatt Earp, it happened to other, other characters. And yet with Wild Bill Hickok, when you find out what he really, what James Butler Hickok really was like, I think there's going to be a lot of admiration there, because not that he didn't have his flaws, you know, he did. There's no doubt about it. But he was somebody who had a code of honor. He stuck to it. He celebrated the underdog, defended the underdog. He had a strong sense of law and order. You know, he took the job that was Marshal of Abilene, which was not a good idea. You know, Abilene was a really rough town. I mean, the guy the guy he replaced had been decapitated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, you know, so is this is this a good recommendation for a job? And it wasn't like a pay, you were not paid very much to be a frontier lawman and there was no benefits. You know, there was there was no 401k or anything like that. <laughs> and, and no life insurance. And yet he took the job because he was fiercely believed in law and order and Abilene needed it very badly and he wanted to build on his predecessor's efforts and and he did. Ironically, the reason why Abilene eventually discharged him as marshal is because they didn't need him anymore. Yeah. You know, the town had gotten too peaceful. <laughs> victim of a success. He was, he was a victim of his own yeah. success. He cleaned up the town. So, okay, it's clean. We don't need, you know, we don't need a two-gun marshal anymore. You're enjoying my conversation with Tom Clavin, author of Wild Bill, the true story of the American frontier's first gunfighter. You can visit our guest at tomclavin.com and enjoy our chat about his previous book, Valley Forge. You can find that in our archives at iHeartRadio or wherever you're listening. Kirkus Review writes of Wild Bill, quote, Clavin writes fluently and often entertainingly of a man shrouded in legend while being all too human. Tom, I can confirm for listeners who can probably tell from my excited tone here that my my words aren't even keeping up with my brain how much I enjoyed your book, Wild Bill. It is entertaining, that's for sure. And it's not just because of the subject, which is entertaining and the man that really can hold your attention, but your writing style is. In one footnote, for instance, you mentioned J.B. Edwards of Abilene, Kansas, claiming at 106 that he was the last man alive who knew both Wild Bill and city lawman Tom Smith, but, quote, no one stepped or was wheeled forward to challenge him. I love little things like that, a little joke like that. It doesn't hurt anybody, right? It doesn't take away from the real history, but it's true, and it's a vivid image for this guy. So your natural humor is helped by the funny stories and accounts of Wild Bill. So I wanted to ask if you had a favorite funny story that you maybe hadn't heard before or thought was a myth and were surprised to find out was true when you got the real details as you researched him. For instance, there's one that he told himself many times, you write in Wild Bill until everybody had heard it and knew the punchline about him being backed up against the cliff facing impossible odds. Do you have that story or another one that really stuck with you that you love to tell? Well, there is the one that you were just alluding to that Wild Bill liked to tell. Now, Wild Bill, you had mentioned earlier in the, in the in this conversation that he did come to embrace some of the stories about him, even the ones that were kind of embellishments. 
you know, his attitude was, I can't change what people are saying about me. You know, it's not it's really kind of harmless. So I'll accept it. You know, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life trying to have disputes with people over what's been said about me. And so most people believed that while Bill was kind of invincible and that he always managed to get out of the toughest of scrapes. And yet every so often, if he had a, an audience that he didn't think had heard the story before, he'd be, you know, sitting at the bar or standing at the bar and and you tell a story about how he was out scouting, and then suddenly he was discovered by an Indian war party, and they chased him across the across the prairie, and he got into these rock formations, and he worked his way in, and then suddenly found out that there was no way out, and he had his back to the wall, and the Indians were coming through the, the rock formations, these crevices, and as they came through, he would shoot them, and then he ran out of ammunition, so he would knife them and you know fight them with knives against their spears. And then he would pause, and you know the listeners were like, "This is so incredible! How Wild Bill possibly get out of this one?" And uh, they would say, "Well, what happened? What happened?" And he said, "Well, they killed me, boys." You know, <laughs> and there would be this stunned silence, <laughs> and then they would start cracking up, you know, because they totally so bought it that Wild Bill was unkillable. But Wild Bill did have a sense of humor, and so when I was writing the book, I wanted to have humor in the book or write some things in a humorous way because it reflected who the main character was. He had a good sense of humor. He liked to, he liked to laugh. He liked to, you know, he was a saloon guy. You know, if you were to say, is he more like Bat Masterson or Wyatt Earp? He was more of a Bat Masterson guy. He liked to go to the saloons. He liked to gamble. He liked the company of, of women. And he was an attractive man, and, and women were drawn to him. He didn't take, he took life seriously if it needed to be taken seriously. But on the, on the other hand, when he was when he was in the saloons, he was at the uh, the gaming tables, he wanted to have a good time to to relax. There was certainly, uh, you know, going to be enough challenges out on the prairie the following day. I love that. And you can see where he would have been somebody drawn to the stage because mm -hmm. he's crafting that story, honing that story over all the times he says it, which is great. And you could just see it hanging in the air because it's classic comedy, right? It's classic misdirection. He's yes. leading you to believe that he's telling this serious story and all these things and there's life and death. And then right. just leaves it hanging there and stops talking. You probably could hear a pin drop in, in a lot of those bars where they're hanging on his every word. It's just a, a beautiful moment and beautifully told. And it makes him really come to life even here where you say that's a good story that's a good storyteller you'd walk into a bar and see him and you wouldn't feel like uh oh I'm, I'm about to get shot because i sneeze at a bad mm -hmm. time and he's losing at poker you know especially poker playing that's what we picked right. right partially because of how he unfortunately meets his end but that wasn't him that was he wasn't reaching for that gun first he just happened to be very very mm -hmm. good at what mm -hmm. he did exactly yeah and you know he, he honed his storytelling abilities too when he was out on the frontier because you know, he'd go on these long scouting trips, and he would be with some other scouts, or he'd be accompanying the regiment he was scouting for. It could have been Custer, it could have been somebody else. At night, you camped, and there was no there was no iPad, there was no television. You know, there was nothing. <laughs> you sat around the fire, and you told each other stories. That was your entertainment, and and he was a good storyteller. Wild Bill would be there as part of the the gang. It wasn't like he was off by himself. He would be part of the gang, and he would be listening to other people's stories, and they would be listening to his stories. That was their form of entertainment every night when they were out on the prairie. So by the time he was in his 30s, uh, he was a very accomplished storyteller, and people would enjoy it. They would ask him to tell a story, and he would, he would often oblige. There was no reason for him to be dismissive or aloof. And his stories inform so many of the stories we've told because they're so universal. Those Western stories, the moments that we love, for instance, in uh, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Eli Wallach's Tuco is in the bathtub, mm -hmm. right? And he, the guy comes in, and if you read the story, this guy was very bitter, the actor. They just found some Italian actor, and they dubbed him over. Uh -huh. And I think he was just reading numbers, but the director, Sergio Leone, encouraged him to really think of the worst thing that you could, and he was very angry. And Eli Wallach ends up shooting him. Right, he has a gun under the water. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he has a gun in the bathtub with him. And he tells him, when you have to shoot, shoot. Don't talk. And Wild Bill has a story very like that with this Irishman named Sullivan that you have here in Wild Bill, the true story. And he's there and he's literally telling Wild Bill and everyone else who will listen how they're going to report Wild Bill's death and how they're going to report me killing him and how cool it's going to be. <laughs> and Wild Bill eventually just shoots him, right? And he says he talked himself into his grave. So how should we remember these men who Hickok did put in their graves as more than just those generic red shirts of the Old West? Well, obviously they picked the wrong guy. You know, you had some people that deliberately did seek out Wild Bill because of his reputation. And, and you know, we've seen this plot line in 
in many, many movies, uh, such as The Gunfighter with Gregory Peck and, and, and other pictures like that, where you, you have this younger, faster gun that wants to take out the top guy. You, know, you can immediately, overnight, make your own reputation as a gunslinger, as a man-killer was the phrase they used back in those days. If you if you kill the guy who has killed others, uh, you know it's, it's like knocking off the champion in, in boxing. You become the champion. Sure. So there were some who deliberately did. There were some that that were foolish. Uh, they they were they were drunk and they were belligerent. And unfortunately, because their senses were so dulled, uh, so to speak, they didn't quite grasp the gravity of the situation. The book opens with a gunfight in Springfield, Missouri, in 1865, and this man Davis Tut had stolen Wild Bill's watch, and he was walking around the plaza, the main square, you know, showing it off, bragging, basically, of what he had done with Wild Bill. What a foolish thing to do, to wave this red flag in front of the bull. And even then, when they when they had this confrontation, you know, Wild Bill let him draw first, you know, he didn't want to shoot him, he kept saying to him, you know, I'll buy the watch back from you. <laughs> you know, he didn't want, to, didn't want to kill anybody. Yeah, everything. So I think what these guys did is they just picked the wrong man, even when Wild Bill gave them a way out, they weren't smart enough to seize it. You mentioned him and his time in Abilene, Kansas, and I wanted to mention that. He's celebrated there alongside favorite son, Dwight D. Eisenhower. I've been to the town. I went for the Presidential Museum, and then I found there were so many museums, and there was so much left of these Victorian mm-hmm. homes and things from back in the Wild West times. When people pick up your book, Wild Bill, and they maybe want to go and see some of the Old West, something beyond just a kitschy thing where it's it's not really very accurate and you know people are wearing watches walking yeah. around it and you really don't feel like you're absorbed by it, but maybe you want to go walk some of the ground where Wild Bill walked. Where can you go? What is left of his Wild West today? Well, not a lot. I mean, in Abilene, there definitely is a part of Abilene that you can immediately feel like you're back in the Old West, that you're back in the 1800s. So there is something of, of Abilene that remains to this day of, of frontier Abilene. But you go to places like Hayes City, uh, Wild Bill was a lawman there, you're not going to see much. Even these days, if you go to Dodge City, I think Dodge City is a great place. And when I've been there, the uh, really, really nice people in Dodge City. But they'll do for tourism reasons and for income reasons, understandably, they'll do the reenactments of things in Dodge City and shootouts or whatever. But for the most part, that's not the Dodge City of the 1800s anymore. Their number one industry right now is, is a meatpacking plant. You know, that's that's not huh. saloons, not not, <laughs> not sexy, not, not bordellos, you know, not, not, <laughs> not gambling halls and music halls. So it is it is kind of hard. However, there are great publications like Wild West Magazine and True West Magazine that that will you know let people know. Okay, here's what's coming up in the next few months in different towns in the West that have these reenactments. And, and some of these reenactments are kind of bogus. And some of them, they, there really are attempts to, like in Cheyenne, places like that, to have things be authentic. So if you do a little research, you can, you can separate what is, you know, at least somewhat connected to reality from what's just fantasy. And they're basically fulfilling what people's imaginations want to see. You mentioned his experience fighting in the Civil War, and then after Lee's surrender, that Hickok is one of those who turns his attention to fighting against Native tribes that are resisting westward expansion, trying to cope with westward expansion. How does that experience impact the Wild Bill legend that people will experience here in your book as historians take a second look, a third look at the way that the Aboriginal people were treated after the Civil War, after many of them had fought for the Union? For instance, the Cherokee, we Mm -hmm. talked about that in Blood Moon, in that book where you had the Cherokee taking sides for and against the Union. Now you look at Wild Bill, and as with the gun, people may be thinking, well, maybe I don't want to read this story of him. So tell us that. How should we look at him in that broader context of the West as we see it from 2019? Well, I think of Wild Bill, what's particularly interesting about that is that he you know, he grew up with his father was an abolitionist. His parents were abolitionists, and, and even not just philosophically, but they actually were his – the Hickok Farm was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And Hickok grew up not having any kind of prejudice against African-Americans. And in fact, in post-Civil War, he agreed and signed on to be a scout for the 10th Cavalry or the 10th Regiment, which was an all-black unit after after the Civil War. And as you can imagine, a lot of other scouts, especially any of those that may have served for the Confederacy, they wanted nothing to do with working with black soldiers. But Hickok was fine with it. He had, he had no problem with it. He had no, no prejudice. 
But then it is a different story as it was for most people on the frontier when it came to Indians, because Indians were seen as two things. One is physical threats. I mean, if you were ran into an Indian hunting or war party, chances are you wouldn't come out of it too well. But they also were, I don't know if I want to use the words, they were an existential threat. They were, they were an obstacle. They, were, they stood between this manifest destiny, migration, moving west, founding ranches and farms, and, and, and they were in the way. Few people had any respect for Indian Native American culture. You know, the white people saw it as several, you know, generations ago in civilization, the Indians needed to catch up. And the best way they had them catch up is, is as quickly as possible, have them act and live like white people, because we were higher on the evolutionary ladder, as far as we were concerned. And Hickok, I don't think, had any particular dislike for Indians or any, uh, there's nothing that I found that he had any kind of uh, bitterness or bias or prejudice against Indians. But he was a man of his time and that you had to protect yourself against Indians and you scouted for Indian war parties because you had to get safely and get your wagon train safely across, your regiment safely across from, from point A to point B when necessary, when there were fights and he participated in fights with Indians. You survive. And if that means you have to shoot to kill, that's what you did. And he certainly did his share of that. Only in his late 30s, not that he gets uh, any older, really. As you said, he packs so much here into his short life, which we're trying to do here in the interview to give people a Uh taste of the book. There's still so much more in Wild Bill, but he begins to lose his eyesight, as I hinted at earlier. How will readers find this man whose life literally depends on sharp vision to hit his mark and protect his life and the lives of others? How will they find him coping with that loss? Well, I think I mentioned in the book, and it's kind of a coincidence that the Hickok family, hundreds of years ago, farmed the Shakespeare property in Avon, England. Right. There, there is kind of a Shakespearean tragic aspect to Hickok's life, that he, was, he ascended great heights, and he became a celebrity. He became this iconic figure of the American West, and then it started to be taken away from him, like the... The West started to pass him by. There were, the law enforcement became more sophisticated. It wasn't just that you faced the man down because he didn't want you to draw on him. And then, you know, it was taken away from him and that he had this eye ailment. There's different speculations as to what caused it, but that he was going blind. Most people would not don't know anything about that, but that was something that bedeviled his Scott the last couple of two, three years of his life, that he was gradually losing his eyesight. And if you're a gunfighter, if you're a scout, even if you're a gambler, yeah. you know, what can you do with, your, with poor eyesight? <laughs> yeah. So it's unfortunate that he was still in his 30s when he was murdered. On the other hand, it saved him for what may have been a really kind of a tragic rest of his life. Tom, we have time for one final question. I want people to know, though, that there is so much more here. The book is called Wild Bill, the true story of the American frontier's first gunfighter. But it could have an S. It could be plural. It could be the first stories yeah. or the true stories, rather, of the because there's so much in it. I mean, there, you just casually threw out Shakespeare. If this <laughs> was a novel, you wouldn't believe all the cameos of people that show up. You'd say, come on, your editor would make you take that right, out, right? right. What, what are you trying to wedge Shakespeare in here? Come on. Yeah. But that final question is about that legend, the true part of it, the true man behind it, James Butler Hickok. He vigorously defended his good name. For instance, there's the story that he travels up to Binghamton, New York, and he leaps on stage and he punches out an impersonator yeah. in a third-rate play, which people can right. enjoy in the book. So he he protected his legacy. And as I as I teased you about earlier and accused you of being a little afraid that zombie Wild Bill will rise from the grave if you gave him a hard time, called him a dandy, uh-huh. I wonder, as a biographer, somebody who lived with him for all these months of writing the book, what do you hope is the face of Wild Bill that you show to readers, one that, as a fair man, as a man who loved justice and loved truth, the American way, there's a reason kids in the 50s and 60s read about the Wild West right alongside their Superman comic books. What do you hope the book will be that would please not just your readers, but also the legendary gunslinger if he read it today? Well, he was very much his own person. He was confident in his abilities. He was mostly fearless in situations. He had a code of honor. He thought that he was living the life that one should live with honesty and integrity, and he didn't want that to be questioned. It should not be questioned because it was a lot of extra work to not take shortcuts, to do things the right way. There's, a, there's an anecdote in the book where uh, a story gets published and circulated in a couple of newspapers that Wild Bill Hickok was shot to death by a couple of Texans. 
And the word's going around, and they're starting to plan these, you know, morning rituals for poor Wild Bill. You know, he, he was taken too soon. His wife hears, his wife hears it. Yeah, and a couple of days later, there's a letter in the, one of the newspapers that's from Wild Bill. <laughs> he says he had a letter to the editor <laughs> published saying, you know, uh, I'm not dead. But the thing that bugged him that he pointed <laughs> out in there is I would never let a couple of Texans get the drop on me. <laughs> you insulted me. I'm not, I'm not so upset that you think I'm dead. You know, I'm okay if the story gets circulated. That's not true, and we correct that easily enough. But that's insulting to me that I'm going to let a couple of Texans get the drop on me. Never happened. And so that, I think, was that letter to the editor was an indication of that. You know, he had a pride, and most of it was well-placed because he did honest work for an honest day's pay, and he cared about what he was doing. He cared about people. He protected people. He was, like I said before, you know, if you were the underdog, you had a defender in Wild Bill. And so he did not want to die, and actually with the way he was murdered, he didn't have any time to reflect upon the fact that he was dying. But if he had had that opportunity, I think for the most part he would have said, I lived life as best I could, as honestly as I could. Was an honest guy, a sweet guy, which may surprise yeah. people. That's how I read it in Wild Bill. A uh, respectful guy, humble guy. In fact, when he writes that letter to the paper, he even tells them, I read your paper yeah. uh, above all others. I've subscribed That's right. to it. I've been reading your paper for X number of years now. He <laughs> yeah. wanted to toss that in there. Like, hey, you guys are doing a great job, by the way. <laughs> yeah, in case, well, or in case they didn't want to publish the letter, right? Just like today. If you want your letter read or published by the Washington Post or something, and you say, well, hey, let me, let me put in, you know, I do remember... I'm a reader. I'm a loyal reader. How many times you hear on talk radio, right? I'm a long time listener or on right. C-SPAN. Oh, Brian Lamb. I love, I love watching C-SPAN as if they weren't going to publish Wild Bill's letter of coming back from the dead. Right. But you know, right. he didn't want to, he didn't want to presume. You're a great guy. And yep. this is one of those interviews. I feel that people might think, Hey, well, what is there left to read? But believe me, don't, don't cheat yourself. Pick up Wild Bill, the true story of the American frontiers, first gunfighter by Tom Clavin. Tom, thank you so much for joining me today, oh, my for pleasure. putting up with my effusive praise here for your book. <laughs> I wish you the best of luck here with telling the story of the man behind the legend. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Again, the book is Wild Bill. The True Story of the American Frontier's First Gunfighter. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there. Or even navigate via the Amazon banner at the top of our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com. That banner takes you through to Amazon. And Amazon.com gives us a small portion of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just those few extra clicks, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My thanks to Tom Clavin for joining us and introducing us to the fastest gunslinger in the West, who defined the way people view the era to this day. Visit him online at TomClavin.com and let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at HistoryDean, on Instagram at the History Author Show, or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular 